Hello, invisible listeners of the future. Welcome back to The Roll Report. This is another episode of Classin' Up the Joint. This is the part of the show where we ask really smart people really silly questions. Most of the time. Uh, my name is Colin. I use he and they pronouns. I am the GM of our uh, live play, and I like talking to people, so I get to do this part, too. I am here with fabulous guests, uh, the hosts, founders, writers, creators. some point, I'm going to get a full bio from people of the Slovenly <laughs> Trolls, uh, which I have recently discovered and is amazing. Uh, please, fantastic guests, if you would introduce yourselves. I don't know who wants to go first. <laughs> I... Sure I Sure, sure. Me, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, hi. Yes. Hello. I am Sade, she, her, and I am the best co-host of the Slavonly Trolls podcast. Thank you. <laughs> the best. The best. Yeah. The best claim. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm Lissa, she, her, the bester, the bestest, <laughs> queen of the podcast, you know, matriarch. Hi, it's me, Lissa. Just queen yourself the matriarch? Oh my god. Bold. I know. Er. Listen, listen, you started this. You started this I by did. saying you're the best, hey. best host. And I, I, I got caught unaware. So now I have to one up you and I triple up you. Question mark. Yeah, that's, I, I mean, that's there's gotta be there's there's a third, there's a layer there somewhere. We did best, <laughs> bester, bestest, and then there's, you know, the best to the infinity. Like I don't know. Bestest dist dist. Yeah. yeah. Bestest sister dist matriarch queen. Where's yeah, an elementary it. school child for superlatives when you really need one, you know? Oh my God, really? Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I was a walking thesaurus. I don't yeah. have one. <laughs> um, do, do either of you have, I guess, the, the, the quick elevator pitch of what is the Slovenly Trolls? What, what would you like people to most know in like a few sentences? Because we'll get into it more, of course, but mm-hmm. the quick version. Oh, God, the elevator pitch. Go ahead, Lissa. Quick, the quick version is if you like verbal essays that go on for as long as three hours that give you lots of context and sometimes include so much real-world context and sociology that sometimes we have to remind ourselves, we're a and d podcast, guys. <laughs> uh, so while we're talking about masculinity and femininity and geeks in the real world uh let's tie this back to D somehow and we talk about lore and history of dungeons and dragons and why it seems like there's a lot of sexism involved then that's your cup of tea then this is your podcast for you <laughs> I, I'd like to think that's a cup of tea shared in common by like many listeners of the Roll Report, myself included. Uh, so, so you look at the the lore and historical context of D anD D and and community and source books through a feminist lens, glasses. Yes. It's it's very like feminist yeah. analysis of D anD D as a hobby, and that includes both you know, the lore of the game. And that also includes the companies who own Mm -hmm. the game. That includes the people who make the game. That includes Mm -hmm. like, we try to give context and a greater context to everything because there's nuance to every topic, no matter Mm -hmm. how much we like to think there's not. It is easier sometimes to think of things as black and white, but most things are just gray. And we try to tackle that as best as we can while also inserting our opinions and acknowledging our own biases. Because obviously when you call yourselves a feminist D&D podcast, you're like, okay, they come with a certain like, you know, expectation or whatever. And we totally do, but we try to be, you know, as fair as possible and give a fresh perspective and also, you know, encourage people to just do better overall in the hobby. Like if you listen to our podcast and you discover something and you're just like, oh my God, I didn't even realize this. I'm going to change that. That's just what, that's it. Just change a little Mm -hmm. bit of what you what you yeah. think you know and do just a little bit better and make it more welcoming. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I well, guess I should like point out like we start when we started this podcast, and I, I don't know if this is one of your questions, but when we started this podcast, we literally had no idea about the history of Dungeons and Dragons. And wow. so the entire journey, if you start from episode one, is us finding out piece by piece, putting together all of these pieces of the history of Dungeons and Dragons and of the history of the lore and how the lore has developed throughout different like bit by bit yeah. through topics um so if you start from the beginning you'll journey along with us as we find out 
<laughs> What's the big <laughs> issue with D and D? You'll see us it's lose a great our minds <laughs> many times. Yes, many it's a times. really fascinating journey. Um, I'm curious. Uh, oh man, I it, in I had half a thought, and then you said something else, and I was really interested in that, and then I lost it. <laughs> uh, oh, wait. I, I, I think I was. I think I was going to ask. Um, well, is there? I guess one the quick. Uh, best thing you have discovered about the history of D and D, if you have, or like, I don't know about best, but like most uh, uplifting and hopeful. Like, I I feel like what I have discovered is a lot of outright misogyny and racism that was sort of couched in fantasy language. And uh, I haven't done enough research to know if that was like very on purpose. It seems like some people really think Gary Gygax was a huge, unrepentant, sexist, racist asshole. <laughs> and some people think he is a product of his times. So so I'm curious, whatever, what, if there is a thing that each of you have found that was like, oh, this was a moment in the community or in, in the company or in the hobby that was like really hopeful. Especially if it was like, I don't know, before the last 10 years, because that would be like really hopeful to me, like some <laughs> amazing piece of feminist lore got s- slipped in there in the 90s or something. Oh, 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 okay. So I have a twofold answer, if that's okay. okay. So my yeah, first absolutely. answer is just by nature of our podcast, looking at the entire history, I think both Lisa and I have talked multiple times about doing this, but we just haven't got around to it because we keep finding more stuff. The timeline of D&D is 100% improving. Like there is no ifs, ands, or buts about ifs, ands, or buts about it. Like if you mm-hmm. look at the trajectory of like problematic things that were in OD and D, which is like zero, like not even first edition D and D, like the first ever D and D that was brought to a con all the way until fifth edition one D and D, it's in terms of like sexism, the bar graph goes way down. Of course there's gonna be some hiccups. Of course there's still gonna screw up because in the bowels of the history of D&D and who made the game, it's just kind of there and it's really an uphill battle. But if you look, if we were to bar chart it, it would be way down. And that I think should be very hopeful for a lot of us, especially in the times where you see things about Wizards of the Coast coming out, where you see things about people who work on the book, where you see these things slip through the cracks and you're just like, oh man, I thought they were doing better. They totally are. It's just... Sometimes in the little miasma that is social media, it's really, really hard to look at the bigger picture. But looking at the bigger picture, overarchingly, it is getting better. I promise. So that's my first part of my answer. My second part is like a specific part of lore that I was really surprised to see was like not problematic and was actually super feminist was Baba Yaga in second edition, Dungeons and Dragons. So the character of Baba Yaga from Slavic folklore is present throughout all the editions of D&D. And if you listen to our podcast for any amount of time, you know that I have a personal vendetta against second edition. Um, Just a blood feud, really. (laughs) Uh I don't like it for many, many reasons. But what one thing they did that was really great is they did this adventure about Baba Yaga. And they took, I believe, inspiration from a Dragon Magazine article and then made an entire adventure book about it. And it was written by a woman And you can tell. And it is not sexist. It still has the ageist kind of properties that come along with the Baba Yaga story. But they could have done so many terrible, terrible, awful things. And they didn't. It was actually very, like, they made her such a cool villain. And they made, she's one of the only villains in D&D that I've ever come across as the horror for lore on our podcast. (laughs) Uh, She's one of the only ones I've ever come across where the, it's in the, like, in the player's handbook of that Mm -hmm. specific adventure and in the DM's, I'm sorry, in the DM's version of that specific um, handbook, it says, if your players go up against Baba Yaga, they will die, full stop. You should encourage them to not do that because she is no joke. (laughs) She will kill you and Uh she will make you suffer for it because she is more powerful than any other being and she is second only to the gods. And I'm like... Mm -hmm. This is the best thing I've ever read. This is from 1980. <laughs> oh uh-huh. my God. And it was written by a woman and you can obviously tell. Yeah. And that kind of gave me a little bit of hope and really reminded me, you know, when we get lost in the bowels of old D&D that 
there are little beacons of hope even then. Like when they give the reins to people of color, when they give the reins to women, Mm -hmm. they've always been around, but they just weren't given the same opportunities, obviously, Mm -hmm. as a reflection of the real world. So that's my two little long-winded answer. As a, as a quick follow-up before getting, Lisa, getting to your answer, like have, are those opportunities, do you feel like increasing? I, but I guess I see them increasing a lot in indie space, like in, yeah. in the ability for anyone anywhere to make a new RPG game and, and a new mm-hmm. system if they want. But like, I guess within within D&D, within that system, do you think those opportunities for people of color and femme-identifying people are increasing? Good. I, <laughs> More yeah, again, looking, yeah, again, looking at the bar chart, opposed to OD&D from 1973 all yeah. the way until 2024, absolutely they are. Are they increasing enough? That's more of up, you know, up up for debate. Are they doing the best job ever? That's also up for debate. But again, if you look at it statistically, yeah, Mm -hmm. I think it is very, very much improved. And Mm -hmm. it's going to continue being a journey because you have to keep putting the work into these things. Yeah. Right. So we can't just say, oh, we won it. We won it. We did it, guys. Feminism won. Sexism's over. Misogyny and D&D doesn't exist. Racism's over. (laughs) Barack Obama was president. You know, like, no, 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 no. We have to keep, like, (laughs) we have to keep doing the work, guys. Sorry. Like, we can't just go to bed and call it a day, even though we really, really want to, because we're all very Mm -hmm. tired. But I think, yeah, definitely. It's improving. But we have to keep working at it. Yes. Always. Uh, Lissa, hopeful, hopeful discoveries. From your deep dives into the history Hopeful of D anD D. Well, I I can't remember if it was like early D anD D, but was Igwil also yeah. semi semi feminist back in the day when they created her? Because Igwil is so you might know her by her alias, uh, other names. So she goes by Igwil. She goes by Natasha. She goes by Tasha. And if I say Tasha, you know Tasha's cauldron of everything. Mm-hmm. So very iconic daughter of Baba Yaga specifically who became a demonologist and who was just a really bad bitch honestly yes. just a really <laughs> bad bitch who uh took over and like took power over demons and you know studied demons and wrote a whole book about Tasha's uh what's her book called Dem- the demonola the Demonomicon of Igwilf. The Demonomicon mm, of mm-hmm. Igwilf. Yeah. Yeah. She wrote that book about demons specifically and did kind of her like research and like who doesn't love an academic woman? <laughs> who like yep. what what's who's like who has power, who, who's so powerful that she has power over demons and she can like summon them. And then she ended up like having like a kind of fling with one of them. And they had a kid. And there's like a whole story there. But you know, mm. um, yeah, I think that. And and she's the daughter of Baba Yaga. So how how is that not feminist? Like two strong female role models, yeah. like a well, matriarch and then her daughter who becomes this powerful, powerful being and academic and goes on to study and uh, take over the world. And I love that that is, you know, again, as someone who has not done the dives into in previous editions and lore, Tasha's cauldron and the demonomicon, like these things still survive and anyone with half an interest, hopefully, in like, who was this Tasha person that like it, their name is on a few spells that are now standard and and now there's the book of every cauldron and everything, like who is this mm-hmm. person? You find this like really interesting and intricate feminist story for who this person is and how they become so important to the world. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it's funny yeah. that like, in in the positive way that D D really likes its history and references its historical things like from A D and D that have gone through in the same way, unfortunately, there's still like those bad things coming through and slipping through because all the things that were put in in the beginning, the good and the bad, you know, they kind of stick around until you go through all of the work to actually pick out the things that are problematic mm-hmm. and if you don't have the right eye, if you don't have the right person, if you're on a time crunch, if you, yeah, it, it just, it, it gets better, but that's not to say that there's not still, you know, problematic things from the 80s mm-hmm. still left there because Absolutely. it's a lot. They did so much work in the 80s and afterwards and throughout history that like, there's so much to go through. 
And yeah. that's what we're also seeing on this podcast. It's like, okay, which topic do we do next? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so several years in, do you still have like a backlog, like a long spreadsheet of like, these are all the books we didn't get to or like the lore corners of the multiverse and things? Like uh, We have an entire oh, wow. Google Doc of just for future episodes because... We've been so lucky in that we have a pretty interactive like base of people who listen to our podcast. So they'll reach out on Twitter. They'll sometimes email us. They'll DM us. Um, sometimes they'll just reply to our comments on like threads or Twitter or something. And they're just like, hey, have you looked into this? Or hey, I noticed you didn't talk about this piece of lore. Why is that? Because they are just like, as curious we got about a Google it Doc. sometimes. <laughs> just we waiting. have a whole Google mm-hmm. Doc, yeah. And we usually, we definitely don't go like, oh, we're going to like go book by book by book by book because we would, that's just not how we operate. We mostly go topic through topic through topic. And then we, mm-hmm. you know, source the books we need to source. Um, the Forgotten Realms Wiki and the D&D Wiki are great jumping off points for us. We usually don't like cite anything directly from them because we've, at least I found a couple of times that they cite things a little bit out of context. So like mm-hmm. I'll use their um, their bibliography and like look into like where they say that sure. things are. And yeah, we have like, I want to say it's a bit 20 pages long of like screenshots and messages. And we have, so people ask us all the time, like, oh, do you think you'll ever go outside of D&D? Will you look at Pathfinder? Will you look at this and this? And we're like, yeah, maybe. Um, we're not nearly done enough with D&D, though. I don't, I don't think you guys realize, like, <laughs> how much in stuff five years, there is. Like- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, we're a monthly podcast for a reason. Mm-hmm. Like, we started monthly because we're like, oh, we don't know how much time we could dedicate but then when sometimes when we can dedicate more time, we're like, still, no, this still, like, we could just get more research time in. Like, we still need a month to, like, go through everything for every topic. It's nuts. Mm. Yeah. Is there, I guess, is there something, Liz, as I'm asking you, is there something you are really excited to get to, not necessarily in 2024, although, hooray, woo, new year, uh, but is is there something that you're like, oh, this one, oh, I can't wait to get my hands on this. Okay, there is one topic that's not necessarily particularly uh, because of sexism, mm. but it's just a grudge that I have, uh, which came up in our recent, well, in actually in the current one that we're working on for, because we're releasing in the next episode uh, at the beginning of next month. So mm-hmm. in about more than a slightly over a week from recording week, day. Yeah. Right, yeah. it's almost February. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the beginning of February is our new episode. So uh, as we were doing our newest episode, I did pinpoint something which has come up multiple times. Okay, there, there's a couple answers. So I do want to still do we we know of what's called like the witches of Rashomon, uh, which are a group of very strong, powerful witches who got magic and who are very. I don't think they're a matriarchy but they are very much a girl power kind of Mm. society Mm -hmm. which i do really want to do and also i have a bone to pick with uh dnd for naming one of its cold locations after a city in finland which is (laughs) not anything to do with sexism but I just need to know why and what. And how. Seems and, slightly lazy compared to everything else they've done. I know it sticks out like a store thumb when they do that. Mm-hmm. I know, and it's and it's one of those things where like you're just reading through a lore book, and then I, and then you're like, wait, I know this word. I mm-hmm. I know that word. Why why is it a cold? like tundra city where there's orcs and like people and and you're reading about like some evil lich lord who lives there and i'm like they have a water park there what are you talking about (laughs) and some really nice fjords what like (laughs) (laughs) what are you saying that um finland isn't home to a giant lich lord somewhere because i need to i'm not saying that i'm just not i'm just saying it's not in (laughs) boss <laughs> that city. Just a where necromancer, would, no liches. Where where would an evil necromancer or an evil lich live in Finland then? Give us the scoop. Where if there was anywhere in Finland that an evil lich lord could be, where would it be in Finland? 
It's, it's one of two places. It's in the very north because the very north is very isolated and, you know, just full of forest. Or it's just any of the other 70% of forest we just have around. This- <laughs> Why would you st- stick it in a city? Like, wh- how how do you do lichdom in the middle of a freaking city when you well, have the country's like 70% all forest? But but a city gives you access to uh, new, you know, ranks to swell your undead army in a way that the forest, you're going for like a natural environment there. You could get some mm-hmm. bears, I guess. But Lich bears. Lich bears. Ooh. <laughs> I could make zombie some bears. bears. Mm-hmm. Giant weird zombie bears. What's the, Ooh. What's the one in... Uh, it's been it's been a long time since I read. I'm thinking about the Bear in the Dark Tower books that has like the weird little uh, rotating antenna cones oh. coming out of its head. Ooh, Dark I Tower has been on my list. I think forever. I've seen that. I think I've yeah. seen a picture of a bear with a like a little twirly there, twirly hat. There's an old edition of it. I, th- <laughs> I think it's the second, maybe the third book in the series. But there's an old edition that has these like really beautiful. I want to say watercolor uh, oh. things that have been contributed. Anyway. Mm. Wear bears. <laughs> Wear bears. Uh, Wear bears. I mean, I mean, okay, yeah, you would get you would get population, but I feel like there's a lot of population that's just randomly scattered living in the forest. Mm. Cause I don't know if you know this, but we are very like COVID wasn't that bad in Finland because we don't like people to begin with. <laughs> uh we socially isolate <laughs> we, we socially isolate uh for fun. Like the whole concept of being a finished person is you want the the ideal life would be you have a second home, which is a summer house, which is uh-huh. not really a summer house, but a summer cottage. And you go there and it's in the middle of nowhere. All you need is a lake and a sauna. And then you just hang out there for <laughs> like an entire summer. That- and you get like random friends to visit. Yes. But but you're like socially isolating from everyone else and you don't want to have any neighbors because once you get neighbors, then you get uncomfortable. And then my mom's threatening to like burn the summer house. We need to find a new one. <laughs> well, like, you know, and anyone closer than like a mile from your summer house is like really encroaching on the neighborhood. Yeah. 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 Wow. I, yeah. Amazing. I, I feel like there's also this sort of like the urbane, sophisticated lich, you know, not ever all of them have to be like uh, gibbering, howling, undead maniacs who are all like after world mm-hmm. domination. Be like, well, no, I just I wanted a nice cup of coffee. And so I turned this Starbucks into my <laughs> lich headquarters. <laughs> they were all soulless anyway. It seems fine. Oh, my gosh. Starbucks is now owned by a lich. That's canon. I'm yeah. 100% putting that in my home <laughs> world. There's going to be a coffee place that's owned by a lich. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Uh, Sharde, is there a topic that you are also particularly looking forward to uh, from this Google Doc? And actually, Lisa, is that a hand or is that, that is a train? That is the that's train. train signal. hand. Uh-huh. <laughs> There's the train. Our, our fourth interview guest is the train. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, sure. Is there is there something on this twenty page list that you are really excited to cover when you get to it? Man, I've been so amped to get back into Drow. You have no idea. Like we did yeah. Drow during our we did a two part Drow extravaganza our first year because we found out they were a matriarchy, and we're just like, all right, let's look into this. We found out they were not a matriarchy; they were a reverse patriarchy, which is a completely different thing. Um, it may like say matriarchy on the tin. You may look at the mm-hmm. definition of a matriarchy and think that's what it is, but the way that the whole society behaves is completely, it's just a reverse patriarchy. Um, and then we did an episode on that. We did an episode on Lolth and Elistri, which are two major deities, feminine deities of the Dark Seldarine. And we just were like, okay, actually, no, I think it was Lissa. Lissa was like, I'm drowned out. Like, I can't do it anymore. It, <laughs> me, it was me like, I oh, know I'm frothing at the mouth. I need mm-hmm. more drow. And so Lissa's like, no, I want to do something else. I'm like, valid. So we did. We put it to the side. I ended up creating an entire D&D homebrew campaign for drow in the meantime, because I just wanted cool. to do more drow things so much. And now I think we have, through just other topics that we've researched, we've come across enough drow lore just passively to potentially do a part three in 2024. And when I tell you, I'm frothing at the mouth. I'm so excited. I just want to do another episode on drow because there's so much there. There's so much potential there. They have such baggage there, but they could be done so well. And we are just champions of drow on this podcast, if nothing else. 
Well, it seems like my my general knowledge of it is, yes, yeah, started as this like really sort of, you know, white man going, what would it look like if women were in charge and and going right into sort of patriarchal subjugation? Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> And but like but it it yeah it seems like there is such a wealth there from the original to now to expand upon and extrapolate and like find you know yeah let's make a real drama matriarchy let's like make yes. it happen yeah yeah make it actually behave like a matriarchy make it like so it's not all a me, quote unquote men's worst fears of being subjugated of not having any rights and I'm just like huh gee Willigers I wonder why they have those fears. So, because, you know, <laughs> like, because because if if we if it comes down to it, if you put women in charge and you gave us rain, a they think that we would take the space of men and we would put them in the space of women, therefore, you know, sexism, therefore keeping right. them, you know, gender pay cap pay, pay gap and all of this bullshit which they've done to us for, you know, how long? Forever and but what a matriarchy actually is, that that's the patriarchy. That's the patriarchal way of thinking about things. What, what the matriarchy is, is basically egalitarianism. You're mm-hmm. like, it's coming from a motherly love, raise everyone up at the same time, and nobody's being pushed down. So it's mm-hmm. kind of c- the community. It's mm-hmm. it's that kind of like love for all of them, taking care of the sick, the old, and showing love to everyone and everybody's kind of equal instead of like this, uh, women are the top and you're our slaves and which is <laughs> what they they were like, okay, yeah, let's make up matriarchy with a drought. Like, yeah, they have slaves and, you know, the men can't do jobs. They can only be cleaners and whatever the mm-hmm. hell. Whatever thing. ridiculous thing. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. What? There, this reminded me of something you you were saying. I think actually in our first moment or two that I was that I was thinking about a little bit that um, I have this theory that feminism, matriarchy, traditionally you know what you might call leftward leaning social and political ideologies seem to me usually to have more of the egalitarian nature and and if they don't want you to do something, it's the idea that well. Everyone should be able to do X, Y, or Z. Everyone should be supported in these things. If you, person, don't want to do them, you don't have to. But you don't Mm -hmm. get to tell me and the rest of my country, town, whatever, that we can't. Mm -hmm. Um, And that that patriarchy and some of these like more what you might call ideological rightward leanings are restrictive in that it's prevent people from doing something versus let everyone do the thing. And if you don't want to, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like lifting one group of people above the rest and not, and making sure that they stay in that position Mm -hmm. of power rather Mm -hmm. than having everybody kind of coexist. And if you want to raise in the ranks, great. If you want to stay in the middle, great. But having like nobody be like sub, literally being subjugated, pushed at the bottom. Like that's just... Man, we could go on and on about it, but yes, that's exactly I, yeah. it. <laughs> I, I can't wait for the next Drow episode whenever it happens. I'm going to be so excited. <laughs> um, wow. Well, on that extremely cheerful note, <laughs> <laughs> insert transition here. Uh, <laughs> see, we can do it. Um, let's let's take a, a, a slight detour into the uh, into our, our you know the stated purpose of these interviews, which is asking you guys about your favorite character classes and subclasses uh, of, of D&D. Um, I might make it a little bit of noise as I try to, like, take notes and write this down, but um, yeah. Uh, if, if anyone would like to start, we'll start, start, by, start with class or classes, and then we'll, like, zoom in from there. Uh, and I would, I would say a lot of people have had, like, you know, I love rogues, but my favorite subclass is this flavor of sorcerer, or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, uh, Chardet, favorite class? Oh, well, it will surprise literally nobody ever to know that my favorite class is the bard because the bards are amazing and I self-identify as a bard, so I'm definitely not biased <laughs> well when I say that. <laughs> yep, Absolutely. bards all the way. Okay, okay. The quick answer for bard all the way, Lissa? quick answer from me 
I I don't know because I've been thinking about this lately because I I've only really fully played like long term campaign speaking for characters now, mm-hmm. and I think like in terms of okay. There's one that I might not make my favorite class, but I did make a favorite. My I did make a fun character out of it, but I don't think it was because of the class. Mm-hmm. But the other two, well, the other three, because I I can like take a class and I can make a fun character and still enjoy it, which is confusing for me. So it's it. So for me, it's the question of like, well, is it the class I like, or is it what I did with the character that mm-hmm. fucked up? Sure. You know, the class and made it different and interesting yeah so i I and you can do both right you can yeah uh, for example i have a strong dislike of warlocks Mm -hmm. just (gasps) not my jam i I don't actively dislike them the way i still pretty much actively dislike rangers and actively dislike blood hunters but like i'm Mm. pretty neutral on warlocks Mm. but the right character, I'd be like, I don't care. This seems great. This like, and it's, and I think mm-hmm. constructing a character that you're excited to play is ultimately more important for totally for your yeah. for your game that you're walking mm-hmm. into. But like, yeah, I don't know. I maybe I, some people have said purely mechanically, like X is why I love this class so much and so hard. And some people have self identified as like, I am a rogue, and that is why I love rogues so much <laughs> I, love I guess all that myself. by way of, right <laughs> all that by way of saying like i i feel like there's a number of ways to approach like what is favorite class and yes all of, yeah. them are, all of them are valid as far as i can say yeah so you know? like i i my three classes that i've played that i really enjoyed my first one obviously because i had no idea what i was doing and ended up playing it somehow so was a monk uh way of the shadows i think yes uh, so kind of assassin monk, mm-hmm. which was very cool, veg- very edgy. Now I'm playing a druid, Circle of the Spores, which is just obsessed with mushrooms. Like, hello, how how could I not like that? I, I guess I like I like classes where you have like a, an exciting flavor too. So it's not just like the typical typical monk so it's not just uh so it's kind of like a roguey monk kind of Mm -hmm. so i guess like a class with a specific vibe that pushes it away from the traditional sort of image that you get of the class i guess is where i'm going with what i like about my classes and then i play i'm playing a bard that is college of whispers which Mm. again super edgy super kind of uh dancing a theme (laughs) <laughs> psychic kind of damage kind of and yeah. and I, I try to morph my characters into versions that are also like not traditional classes or mm-hmm. tra- not traditionally representation of a druid not a traditional yeah. representation of what a bard is is what I try to do with my characters now that I've gotten like the gist of what D&D mm-hmm. is so I'm trying to like stay away from what sure. they traditionally represent by flavoring them and then by even further taking it further with my character to make it like, oh, she's she's definitely not like a very bard, mm-hmm. not like a druid at all. Cool. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's like what a fun <laughs> way to build a character. I know, like I, I I've had I've had the really good luck of somehow try being able to figure out what it specifically is that I like in D D. And mm-hmm. I've all of the characters that I've made so far uh, that I've like stuck to, I've like built into something that I really, really enjoy. And I would not change them for anything. It's really exciting. Yeah. But yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah. I, Sharde, I want to come back to Bards for you and like, beyond the self-identifying like what what draws you so much to a bard because they're they're really cool i will say i have i think i have now said several times i think their level 20 feature is bullshit oh compared to to many others i never got my bard so i played i think i played my bard like my main bard that i took the furthest i think 
we did go up to a level 20 campaign and I still multi-classed her. I multi-classed her into cleric <laughs> because we just needed kind of a oh my healer. God, and it just it yeah, and it made sense. Bards are actually just very good healers if you want to build them that way. And if you multi-class them with cleric, it's it's great. And that's just kind of how she ended up being. And I looked at the level 20 feature and I'm like, well, that's dumb. You get magical secrets at level 17. I just need to get a bard to level 17. So yeah. man, I love bards just overarchingly because I just love the concept of creating magic from art because I mm -hmm. grew up like in choir. I grew up, um, I discovered I really loved writing at a young age. Like I've always had art in my life and music in my life. And the idea of just turning that love and turning art into magic is just so like beautiful and amazing to me. And so when I found out that there was a class that could do it, I'm just like, oh my God, yes, mm -hmm. of course I'm going to do this and just flavor it however you want. You don't even have to have a bard who's good at music. You can have a bard who's a poet. You can have a bard who just really loves reading and stories. You can have a slam poet. You can, you could do, you could have a bard who really likes gossip like Lissa's mm -hmm. does. And her art form is literally like manipulating the bourgeoisie. It's amazing. Oh, I love so, that so much. <laughs> <laughs> that's so amazing it's incredible and they're so they're so versatile they get expertise mechanically speaking which in my opinion the best feature in all of DD is expertise speaking as somebody who it's rolls like crap nice. so that's probably yeah. why i like it um <laughs> you just get like a plus 14 when you're level like yep but sometimes below level 10 and you're just like oh this is great i'll never roll bad again amazing um and i also think that bards are just the quintessent this is very much my opinion Anybody can challenge sure. me on this, but it's my opinion. Sure. Bards are the quintessential D and D class. What other like D and D, like what other TTRPG could you fit a bard into? Like a bard is just it. It's so tied to my idea of what D and D is, wow. uh -huh. and creating like music from and creating like uh, magic from music and having like mm -hmm. you know the minstrel follow people around or the volo type character recording everything but not doing it very well like it's such a DD &D concept and i realized yeah. this recently i'm like maybe that's another reason why i just really like bards it's just so D, &D and you could just flavor them so many ways and i know they mm -hmm. have you know the stereotype of like oh it's the horny bard trope hurdy dirty dur and if you want to play a bard like but that that's totally fine do yeah, that. but there there really is like there is an almost infinite variety of artistic yes. disciplines and then yes. even flavor the charisma however however you want. Exactly. You Can, don't have to play charisma as just like this Don Juan. You really don't have to. You could play you it however you want. You can be the quiet, awkward one in the corner that everyone feels sorry for. And that is yeah. how your charisma... Made. Like, that's... Yeah. Yeah. You, your charisma can literally be something that repels other people because you are so good at... Um, just creating, like you said, like this facade of just like, don't talk to me. I am a mm -hmm. emo poet in my corner mm -hmm. who worships Edgar Allan Poe and you can't touch me and I have carry a skull everywhere. And what? that like charisma, just like, like, nope, don't talk to that person. No, thank you. Bye. <laughs> like, and, of, and of course, <laughs> if no one saw you writing and asked you about it, did you really write anything at all? Like, obviously. <laughs> Literally. You're just like in, oh, you're yeah. in the Lich Starbucks. You're writing yeah. with your little skull. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much for listening to our wild and wacky tales. Fenner here, just asking you to apply your support to us in the form of leaving us a five-star review on our podcast platform. Of course, follow us on social media so you never miss a release date. And maybe, you know, tag us in some pictures that remind you of us. That's at the Roll Report Cast. At the Roll Report Cast on Instagram, on TikTok. All right. And hey, we've got a Patreon. Did you know that? If you sign up for our Patreon, you get special perks, premium content, adless podcast listening pleasure, and you'd never have to hear me say this message again. Back to the show. Something you said about bad, ro bad rolling begs the question for me if you've ever taken a rogue to reliable talent level where then you're just like, oh, nope, I as long as I'm I... decent at it, I cannot roll below a 10, which means I cannot roll below like a 19. No, I played a rogue, I think, mm. in the first campaign I did um, right after re-getting into D&D. &D. So I played 3.5 forever ago, and then I 
transition to LARPing in high school. Mm-hmm. And then um, when I graduated high school, I just kind of had a dry spell of um, role playing just in general and D&D and all that stuff. And so when I re-got into it, I joined a campaign as a rogue. And mm-hmm. I never got her high enough level because the campaign kind of, you know, it, it goes yeah. the way that some campaigns do. It just kind of fell apart. So I never got her to that level. But I did get yeah. her pretty good. You know, her expertise is pretty good. I rolled pretty good for her stats. So, like, she was very good. She was an assassin. So she just, like, killed everything. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. Always fun. But I never got her to reliable talent level, which is just makes me so sad because that, that yeah. mechanic is made for me. <laughs> yeah. I need it. That's great. I... So I've, I've asked a number of people kind of about their their character creation process, like in tandem with favorite classes. And I'm I'm going to I'm going to guess kind of based on what you both have said that for you, when you are creating a new character for a campaign, for one shot, for whatever it might be, that the the story and the narrative and the flavor of how the things are going to work seem to be where you're building from rather than just like, I don't know, I haven't played a fighter in a while. <laughs> yeah. Champion, why not? I will declare myself to be literally everyone's champion, and that's my gimmick. And like, <laughs> off to the and races. Scene. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Listen, let me I, let me direct that to you first. Like in in creation, it it sounds like narrative and and the flavor is more important to you than mechanics. And I'm I'm curious if I'm right, and if you would speak on that a little bit. Yeah. So for me, I think the most important thing is that I need to find a combination of. So what I what I try to do like when I'm preparing for something I need to find a combination of like race or species and class and subclass and then I try to have like an idea so I'll 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 start like looking for possible options of like oh I could play this like this is an interesting class this is maybe the subclass that I would take but it all stems mm-hmm. from like I need a character idea that gets me super excited before I will stick to anything. So like mm-hmm. all op- all options are open until and then if I get the idea. So like with my bard, well, okay, maybe I'll talk about my circle spores character. Sure. I wanted to play a child. I was like, I'm playing a child. It doesn't matter. Like, and I want to play a happy go lucky child, and I want to play someone and then we talked with like the dm we discussed things and i was like okay i could play a druid um and then i i looked at different classes and like what boons are the the race would give me and i was just like okay this thing about mushrooms seems interesting uh, but i need i need more than that so i was like okay well i want to build her into somebody who makes a deal with a mushroom deity. Like Mm, I need, I need mm -hmm. there to be a plot for my character or in the case of my bard, I wanted to create the most non-sexual bard that ever barded. So she is both asexual and she's married to a sugar daddy. So amazing. I, so like I chose a class specifically to play a bard, but I needed there to be a plot and I'm like, okay, sugar daddy, she's asexual. And there's no romance on the table. Let's see what happens. Yeah. So like, as long as there's a plot, I can choose, I can choose like a a class and then like roll with that and then try to like morph that into something that I'm interested in. But as long as there's like a story or I start like, or I start with like a story and then I morph that into going with a class and then a subclass as well. Mm -hmm. But there's, like I need a, something for me to like try and do outside of like a, a character arc kind of thing. I need a personal arc for my character where I can yeah. be like, okay, she will start here and then she will develop into something that I don't know yet. But yeah. she's going to start as a total asshole, total bitch <laughs> uh, who comes from nobility, doesn't give a shit about anyone, uh, is all about secrets and gossip and just is this socialite who... Uh, Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then let's, you know, chip away at that personality and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I it it it's it also sounds like kind of having the the personal arc sometimes you're already like, I know where like I have a seed of like where I want that mm-hmm. to go, like mm-hmm. like the mushroom deity patron or or contact over time. Um mm-hmm. yeah, I that's really cool. I I I don't often do that 
that long range of character planning. I but I that's really neat and inspiring. See, yeah. for, for 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 me, mm. like otherwise, if like the DM's not paying me attention, or if it's not my mm-hmm. character arc, or we're just doing somebody else's arc or something, then I I get bored and then I check out is the problem. So mm-hmm. I need for me to have something else to do. So I have like my bigger plan with this character. So yeah. I have something to work towards, even when they're not focusing on me. I can yeah. still be like, oh, my character goes and does this because she's obsessed with cults mm-hmm. and now she wants to do stuff. So you guys go ahead and go shopping, but uh, my character's going to go and um, pick up some flyers and spread them around and be like, um, you should follow this uh, guy because uh, it's a prank that I'm trying to pull <laughs> on some other person uh, who's definitely yeah. totally not a god. <laughs> uh, but have you heard of him? <laughs> um, so, so there's like I there's always that. something mm-hmm. going on or they yeah. have a hobby or something so i try to make make my character like yeah. as i guess yeah. like as complicated as possible sure well i i think that gives a lot both to you as a player as you're saying to keep you very engaged and also to the dm who i'm gonna say if your dm is doing a good job mm-hmm. will be working with you to try to like bring the like make sure everyone has an arc that is tied to their character's backstory over the course of the campaign provides mm-hmm. that character a little mm-hmm. spotlight and growth but everyone needs to come along and play together. This is, I don't know, this is what I love about D&D, that everyone has to yes and. Everyone has to be yeah, on this exactly. journey together. Mm-hmm. And if you're like, my exactly. character has no reason to mm-hmm. be here, mm. yeah, I, you know, yeah. th- there are varying options of like you and DM are like, okay, let's shuffle that character away and bring someone new in, mm-hmm. or DM needs to do a better job. I don't know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Totally depends on um, the table. It's But it's, it's sure. just like one big collaborative storytelling experience, which I think is what draws a lot of people to D&D. What makes it so unique and what makes TTRPGs so unique is that it's just like everybody wants everybody or should and should want everybody to have like a great time, no matter like who has the spotlight, no matter, you know, what's going Mm -hmm. on in the story. Everybody Mm -hmm. should be having fun, including the DM. Yes. should also be having fun. Yes, very much. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sade, character creation back to you. Does does narrative and flavor kind of guide? I I don't. I guess I don't want to say like everything, but like predominantly, it's it sounded like the the flavor and kind of how you want to create the story and the character has has more guided your creation process. Yeah, I go by vibes 100%. I am a vibe-based player. I definitely choose class first, like mechanically, Mm -hmm. if you want to go like step by step. I do usually choose class first. I'm both a DM and a player. So when I choose player characters specifically, I'm like, okay, what what if I either touch as a DM that I want to explore more or Mm -hmm. what just sounds fun in the moment? What's something new I want to try out? So Mm -hmm. I pick like usually a class and like the barest hint of like a character concept. And then I pass it, you know, by the DM, like this is what I'm thinking of doing. And then usually it's a very collaborative process. Sometimes Mm -hmm. I'll go off and I'll write a bazillion word backstory because I'm a writer and I can't help myself. But then I'll trim it down and be like, here's the three paragraph thing because I know how overwhelming it is for DMs to get like, here's 20 pages. And while getting 20 pages as a DM is wonderful, it's like, oh my God, they're so invested. I'm so happy. It can also be overwhelming because you're just like, oh God, I have to remember all of this and I want to do it justice. And so I'm just like, okay, well, I have, here's the 20 page and here's like three paragraphs. (laughs) Like If you're you're only going to put in like one of my ideas, here's this. Yes, and if you want to talk about thing. all the world building that I helped you do, here's the 20 pages. <laughs> do you want me to build you a town? Do you want me to build you a religion? Do you want me to build you this, this, this? I'll I, do it. Like, you just give well, me the word and I will go as a DM, As a DM, I love that from my players. I like, I Same. think it, it the, the collaborative nature of it to me is really exciting. And it's something like the, uh, the first, I, I really started running games during, during 2020. It was like, I'm sitting right. around, what the fuck else am I going to do? Right. Um, and, but I was Valid. doing a lot of pre-made modules where people's backstories, I guess, are like not necessarily as important. And, the, and like that idea of collaborative storytelling in that sense is kind of shoved to the side since you've basically got a script that you're reading and we're filling in the blanks mm. together. Yes. Um, but now, like now that I'm, I'm, you know, making my own thing for, for the role report and starting a new home game that is completely homebrewed, I'm like, oh, having players that oh. we have one, we have one player, we asked him in December if he wanted to join the game. 
the next day we had seven character concepts in a group <laughs> DM. <laughs> And we have like a 40 page Google Doc with like each of those and the oh. next 17 concepts that he's thought of. Ju Iconic. <laughs> just like, I love you. This is so good. That's amazing. Yeah. Oh, you did. You also did the smart thing. I did the dumb thing when I started DMing. I didn't use any modules. I just went homebrew right from the start because I was just like, because uh, all the home, all the stuff that was out, I started DMing before we did the podcast. So I had mm -hmm. no idea about any Forgotten Realms lore. Like I had no sure. idea about any of it. And I was really intimidated, but I did watch a lot of Critical Role as one does. I started DMing in 2018. Of course I was watching Critical yeah. Role. Yeah. So I had the, the original Taldori campaign guide and that's what I did. I'm just like, I have this campaign guide. I have w been watching campaign, only campaign one was out at this point. I think they mm -hmm. just maybe started yeah. campaign two. And I'm just like, I have this and I know this world, but uh-oh, there's no plots in here. It's just a campaign setting. So I'm like, well, I'm a writer. Um, I can come up with stuff. And I did, but it was very like, I made it way harder for myself than I needed it to be. And I didn't really know any yeah. um, seasoned DMs at that point to kind, or at least not well enough. I knew of DMs, yeah. but you know, you're very self-conscious. You don't want to ask for help. You want to try to do it all your own. At least that's how I felt. So I was like, I couldn't, Definitely. and I, I refused to ask for help from anyone. And I'm like, I'm just going to homebrew this whole thing. <laughs> and that's what I did. And I've still to this day, never run a module because I just, wow. I just awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I fair. I think if that's, if I if I had had uh, I've been trying to think of the non gendered way to like say if I had you know the testicular fortitude that you had at that point <laughs> I like ovarian fortitude like still yeah, gender the like, ovaries <laughs> yeah but, no I but but really I I think you know I I I played a little bit long time ago took a long break and came back yeah. to it I was playing in a game maybe a year and a half or so before I before a pandemic before I started DMing and I was just like I don't know the rules enough and how to kind of make the thing satisfying and I want it to be good because we're all stuck at home and people won't right. want to play if it's not good but mm -hmm. yeah I there's some good modules and there's some like really crap ones and, and yeah I've yeah. I've read through many now mm -hmm. that we've done the podcast and I'm like, oh, I could do that or I could do that or I could do that. So it's definitely not yeah. off the table. I'd love to run one eventually. It's sure. just, it's not my go-to anymore. Like yeah. I run long campaigns. I don't do one shots. I don't do like short things, which I want to try to do more of with players, like with my players. I want to do some one shots. I want to do some other things, oh. but oh. Hi, I'm, I'm a the player and I do one shots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I volunteer. I I volunteer just... as tribute immediately. <laughs> yeah, I'd love I'd love to dip my toes in eventually, but my like my comfort zone at both mm -hmm. as a DM and as a writer is just like I'm going to do this overarching epic, yeah. and it's going to take years, and that's just what's going to happen. It's going to be slow burn all the way. <laughs> it's yeah, it's, it's, it's really do. satisfying. It is. Yeah. Um. Lisa, I guess turning turning the DM side of things back to you, I I do you have thoughts on modules and homebrew and and DMing and collaborating with characters? I've only really 2024 is the the year that I am going to DM for my friends. Yes. <gasps> yes. I'm gonna yes, do it. It's gonna God. happen. It's gonna be great. It's uh, gonna be great. I've only really DM'd for my family. Uh by my family, I mean it started off with me introducing my grandparents to the game that I kept saying that I was playing and the podcast that I kept saying that I'm talking about and them not understanding a single word that was coming out of my mouth when I tried to talk about any of it. And then when I was doing my podcast, they'd be asking me like, are you playing the game? And I was like, no, it's the podcast about the game, but this, they somehow like <laughs> intertwined and they became the same thing, same thing. And now whenever yeah. I'm on the computer, it's like, are you, are you playing the game? And I'm like, I, I just, I just, <laughs> you do other something. things with a computer. I, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know how much you know about like computers, but <laughs> Be believe it or not, you can do more than just the one thing on them there's like a few <laughs> exactly exactly so that i was yeah. like okay you know what this is this is getting to the point where because i i stayed with them uh for one month one time mm -hmm. uh like 
for, for one entire month. And so this went on like multiple times a day, multiple times a week. And, you know, for a week, couple weeks, you know. And so I got to the point where I'm like, okay, listen, um, I will dumb down D&D for you. Uh, you will have to sit at a table for like an hour. Uh, and I will somehow make this work for my grandparents in a way that they can understand. So there's not going to be any dragons. There's not going to be high fantasy. There's not going to be, it's going to be like dumbed down D and D for my grandparents who come from Finland and have a, they're, they're, they're worldly. Yes. But they're not like Lord of the Rings fans. They're mm -hmm. very much like foundation is in reality mm -hmm. kind of people. So I created a character sheet, like just like a, with some simple stats. I think there were like five and then I gave them all, uh, like, I pre-made characters that I based yeah. on their personalities. So I was like, okay, you are uh, Finnish. Um, so we have these, like, Finnish... They're, they're kind of like Finnish elves, but, like, Finnish okay. trolls that live in... Mm -hmm. That we believe that live in kind of nature. So they're, like, little troll elf thingies that are, like, spirits that live in nature. And there's, like, different kinds depending on... Uh, where they're located and they're very location based. So you have like one for the sauna, you have one mm -hmm. for nature mm -hmm. uh, or the forest, you have a house one. So I was like, okay, my grandma is the garden, garden troll. My grandpa, cause he likes putting the sauna on is the sauna troll. Uh, my, so you're living at your summer house and uh there's this family who lives there my aunt, aunt and uncle and their children so my cousins and uh you love living with them but sudden, suddenly one day uh your granddaughter so my cousin so the girl from you know the summer house she disappears and you know she's basically you know she went off to into the forest and she never came back and because you've been mm -hmm. living there in the summer house you know that you need to go save her and so they were super invested in this, like our granddaughter is in danger. Yeah. We have to take our little troll selves and like figure out where to go. And and I was like, okay, well, she definitely took the boat. So like you have to make a boat for yourselves and cross the lake like, and like mm -hmm. and 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 they were super into it and and kind of got the that. gist of what D D was. I gave them some little tasks. I gave them animals to interact with, kind of like a very traditional Finnish style story where they mm -hmm. interacted with like ravens and squirrels and uh and then they found like a moss witch who kidnapped my cousin and they didn't even find out the plot of why and my grandma who was the most non-combative person I've ever met she is like the sweetest person like a ho homely housewife kind of uh -huh. like non-confrontational agrees with everything my grandpa says uh so i my expectation was that there's either going to be no fight or my grandpa's going to bring in a fight and then they're going to like flee. Mm -hmm. My grandma goes up to the forest witch and is like, I blind him and I put a snake in his like sock. And then, and then they grab, <laughs> and then they grab my, the, the, the grandchild. And then I'm like, okay. And then they couldn't figure out like how to get away. And I'm like, there's, there's a spell. You have a spell where you can go from plant to plant. Um, so what if you cast that and you, you, you go back and, and then, <laughs> And then I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, that that yeah. that worked. That worked real well. Yeah. And then and then they got the foundation and they were like, okay, so it's like collaborative storytelling. And you really have to be creative with what you're doing. And like, and they were so because I apparently I used to talk a lot when I was younger, but um as I grew up, I just kind of became more quiet for some reason, mm -hmm. especially around them. So they were fascinated with the amount of stuff that was coming out of my mouth sure co consistently the amount of stuff that i was just saying because usually i don't say that much and then the noises that i was making because i was like oh yeah then there's this then you have this uh squirrel that's helping me he goes tch, 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 tch. and then my grandpa <laughs> looks at me and mm -hmm. he goes can you do that again <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like yeah Love sure fully. Tch, 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 tch. <laughs> <laughs> I, and so yeah they they were fascinated um yeah. and then my aunt and uncle obviously heard about this game and they were like we want to play so that i just i made a part two of like the same thing but added two work players on two. i i love that i have not successfully convinced my family that they should play with me yet but 
someday. Oh. I'm, waiting. I'm just, I, the, my, my nephews and niece are like all almost in like single digits right now. So like um, year or two, maybe when they, mm-hmm, when they get to double mm-hmm. digits, we'll, we'll try to go there. Yeah. Um, well, uh, inserting another transition here, uh, I'd like to, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to, to move to, to favorite subclasses for a minute and then, and then spend a little bit of time like diving more deeply into things you guys have discovered in the podcast. Uh, cause I'm still interested and I still have all the time that I would be very excited to talk about it. <laughs> um, yeah. but, uh, but yeah, I guess, uh, uh, Charday, starting, starting with you again, favorite subclass or subclass is oh, among my. D&D. Well, I'll do, because you said sometimes people give you, you know, their favorite class is one thing, but then their favorite subclass is, you know, from a completely different class. Whatever, I guess, you, whatever you like. <laughs> yeah. So I think my favorite, I'll give you like a twofold answer. So my favorite bard sure. subclass that I have uh, person, I haven't actually played it, which is strange, mm-hmm. but because I should, the College of Lore, obviously, because hello. <laughs> It's just a vibe and it's just, it's so cool to have like an academically minded bard, I think, Mm -hmm. and having cutting words just, (laughs) just is such a cool feature of just like, oh, this person hit. And then you, it's basically like vicious mockery as a reaction. You're just like, actually, Mm -hmm. did they? Actually, actually your mom. And then they miss. (laughs) You like, could have stabbed a little bit lower, a little yeah. to the left. Might have hurt more. Are just you saying. compensating for something? Like, listen, <laughs> and, <laughs> like it's such a cool like feature of that class. And as somebody who just loves to just have the most fun in general and like make jokes and make jabs at stuff, it's just a wonderful mechanic for that. And as for a subclass that's outside of bards, I really, really jive with the Circle of Stars Druid, which is, I believe, from Tasha's. It was going to be, and I don't even think Lisa knows this, it was going to be my class for the campaign we play in together. But then I found out she was going to be a druid. And I'm like, no, I'll let her be a druid. She hasn't played this master yet. <laughs> so I was going to play it, but I was, it was just I decided to be a fighter instead because I'd never been a fighter before. So I chose that. But I remember seeing the Circle of Stars Druid and just, oh, the vibes. Immaculate. Mm-hmm. Immaculate. Mm-hmm. Like, it's an entire, like, you could, you still have your wild shape and you could still be a very connected uh, druid with nature. But then you can, you know, take that from the constellations and from yeah. the stars. You get a star map. You get, like, the starry form that you can transform into. Oh my God. It's just such, I just love it. I I haven't even delved into the mechanics of it. I just love it on vibes mm-hmm. alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Obviously. I mean, and I'm a vibes based player. So. Great vibes. I, a uh, friend of mine who, who was playing one definitely went through and found like the starry constellation version of every wild shape form. So yes. whenever they transform, they like throw a little picture into our chat oh, of like this beautiful, gorgeous. you know, galaxy cat or like yeah. octopus, whatever it might be. A yeah. vibe. Such a vibe. Well, and and the mechanics are really interesting. It like it has some elements of divination wizard, if I'm remembering, yeah. with like the wheel or cosmic wheel and whoa. Mm-hmm. You the the star map to give you guiding bolt for fun and like the different starry forms that are really situationally useful yes. and and yeah mm-hmm. cool yeah. yeah i i do love lore bards too they're very fun i i'll i yeah i'll stand by all bards ever get shafted by the level 20 feature and maybe totally, someone should I, fix that uh, i'll do it <laughs> like yeah. i'll fix it i'll yeah. put it out there like i don't know what it would be but it has to be something cooler than what is it it's just um it's you Just regain a use, you regain one inspiration die at the beginning of combat if you roll initiative and you have none left. I love inspiration. See, the and silence so many says ways. it all. We're all just like, yeah. Uh. Yeah, like inspiration is a great bardic feature. I love inspiration. Um, however, like however, why? you will compare that to like the the rogues is what it's a stroke of luck. You can turn one roll per short or long rest. I think into yeah. a twenty. A 20. Like and you, then, like, the you, if you do all druid, you get unlimited wild shape. That is, the, druids are so hard to kill at level 20. If you've, if, mm-hmm. I mean, Critical Oral fans know this. You've seen Keyleth, and you've seen that, like, they they did that um, that combat episode with everybody against each other mm-hmm. level 20. She wiped yeah. the floor with everyone. She had unlimited hit points. I'm just like, that is the most uh, overpowered thing I've ever seen in my life. I love that. if I remember. Yeah. 
If yeah. I, like if think of that's the episode, yeah. Uh, Scanlan was like, and Feeble Mind is like, doesn't matter. I still know that I have to kill you, and I still can do that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm just like, oh, what an amazing like, because you you're essentially supposed to be kind of a, a demigod at level twenty, mm-hmm. right? Like there are epic boon feats you can get in fifth edition that a lot of people usually don't use, and you can go into like even more epic levels, but they have yeah. not fleshed out that part of fifth edition like they have with past well, editions. I mean, and and just to to quickly respond to that, and then and listen, then to get to your subclass as well, like. Something I've thought about a lot, and and my uh, co DM and I are thinking with our new campaign. What is the the threat that level twenty characters can and or should be dealing with when mm-hmm. you are deity? If you're a wizard or totally. or whatever flavor of ma- magic user, you can wish, you can fundamentally alter reality. Yeah, the the level of magic and things that you're dealing with should be on that scale. And I think yeah. there's a I I think there's a commonality to the approach of party must defeat reality destroying threat with reality destroying magic and weapons. Yeah, you it should always like you should always match it, and then you don't even have to because in my campaign that I run, my players ran into the main plot way sooner than I thought they were going to, and now they're embroiled in some god bullshit, and they're not even level ten yet. So I'm like, oop, uh oh. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it could also be something to just work towards if you want your players yeah. to ha- like reach those epic levels, if you want them to hopefully be invested enough to put in the time and the training and doing these quests and, you know, be invested in things like they are 100 percent. They would not be to God at level eight, level yeah. nine. That that just no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Lisa. No. Spoilers. You're not going to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you will die. <laughs> like uh-huh. I'm sorry about yeah. it. But yeah. it gives them something, it gives them something to, you know, work towards, too. I mean, especially against Mommy Lolf, who... Uh, yeah, Lolf is are, one of them, yeah. <laughs> we are supposedly up against, so... Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and and we've been thinking, what is what is the, what are the other things you can do at level 20? And that's, you know, mm-hmm. that with, with our home game, that's something that we're trying to explore. We're actually, because I, I did three years to get from level one to 10 with mo- a, a half of this group that we've assembled. And now we're like, we're going to do level 10 to 20. And we don't want you to punch the god at the end of it. We want you to do something else. <laughs> yeah, and it doesn't. Like, ha- it totally doesn't even have to be a god. Yeah. It, but you, like you said, it's like a world-ending event that does not have and, to be tied and, to deities. Yeah, yeah. And and one of the things we're interested in is like, well, if you fail, if the world ends and you are level twenty, what is your responsibility to rebuild in the wake of that? Ooh. Do you have any? Do you want to? Anyway, consequences. I, yeah. right? <laughs> Love that. Um, yeah. So, uh, Lissa, turning favorite subclass back to you or I subclasses. Think it, I think it says a lot when you compare Shardae's Druid answer to mine when I say spores to her starry horse. Uh-huh. <laughs> Shrooms versus the vibes of the sky. <laughs> because, because spores is so. It's spores of spores, but it's also necromancy mm-hmm. flavor. Fungus zombies. Yeah, fungus zombies. Like, when I saw that, I was like, I, I'm locking this down. I don't even care anymore. Like, I want to be a druid, and I want to be this druid right now, mm-hmm. right here. Because the flavor of it is so weird and so wonderful that it's like the opposite yeah. of what you would think a druid is all about, which is like life and flowers and, you know, things that are natural, like stars in the sky and prettiness. And then it's like, no. Excuse me. Yes. I feel attacked. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm all about death and decay and like things turning into <laughs> gross things. And then like, they're mm-hmm. all spreading like mold and moss. And yeah. And I'm like, yes, this is me. This is finally <laughs> what I thrive for. So I... To answer that question, yeah, it's it's uh, the yeah. circle of spores, and I'm having a really fun time playing my bard, um, which is the also the circle of College of Whispers, Whispers which is right. all about like secrets and um, attacking attacking people's brains mm-hmm. with words specifically. That so, one. Whispers have the the unsettling words where if you talk to a creature for a minute, 
uninterrupted or whatever, you you force them to make frightened saving throws. Yeah. Mm-hmm, so one, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And also, it's, also if somebody steals or if somebody dies around you, you can become them for yes. uh, a certain amount of time. I, as I, the DM who was around when that happened, she used that once. And when I tell you, all the players went, what <laughs> just happened? <laughs> 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 what is she? What did you do? And me and Lisa were like, you don't know. <laughs> It was, it was also partially because I'd managed to uh, hide the fact that I was a bard because I was the no, most mm, non-bardic right. bard that ever barded. And I was just basically what entered into the game was just a socialite bitch. This like socialite bitch who had a thing for fashion and uh-huh. was vain and really unfriendly and obsessed with money and her sugar daddy. And flashing the credit card and drinking champagne and like the bougiest mm-hmm. bitch that you could like get. That's sure. who I was playing. And with no like mention of like no daggers, never ne- like the first fight I think we ever got into, she literally just ran away. I mm-hmm. I I just I was just like, I'm like, go, go. I think she shouted like go team. And then the next round she like ran away. <laughs> One inspiration <laughs> and I think you got no, this. No. No inspiration, nothing. Oh, I just, just said go team. Because I, I was like, I, I was playing the fact that they have no idea what my character is. They don't know if uh-huh. I'm a monk. They don't know if I'm a rogue. They don't know. Because I was just I was just a socialite. No, yeah. with no kind of like training in fighting, no nothing. So I just like, literally, she just said the words go team, no inspiration. Just the words as a bonus action. And then yeeted herself out of there. And so <laughs> for them to catch on to like what my actual class was, they thought it was a bard. They were like, is mm-hmm. she playing like a cleric or is she? They had no idea for the longest time. And so then when oh, I finally fun. like started doing things with my actual bardic abilities mm-hmm. as she grew into her bardic self, then I suddenly like take take on the appearance of this thing creature that died because we had to go to the top. We had to infiltrate right. like a place. And then they were like, you, you do what? <laughs> you become it's the fine. creature it's fine don't worry about it don't worry we don't talk it. about that <laughs> <laughs> top secret oh yeah. I love that so much yeah yeah continuing in the like such amazing flavor to add to the campaign and to and to your party not knowing what's going on <laughs> yeah. oh, I love that uh well, this is the point at which if you want to hear everything else we're going to talk about, you're going to give us some money on Patreon because that's how capitalism works, although we wish it doesn't. But uh, yeah, uh, if you're not, if you're listening on, on Spotify, thank you. Leave us a review and that would be cool. And uh, and then support us on Patreon if you want to hear all the rest that we're going to talk about of smashing the patriarchy within d d uh, Where can people find you on the internet? Either the, the trolls or you individually if you would like to reveal that information. <laughs> uh, and I'm sure it's not, I guess, that hard to find, but but still, where can people find you? Uh, we are everywhere. Uh, so the Slovenly yeah. Trolls are on Twitter, on Instagram, on Threads, on Blue Sky, and on TikTok. Um, we do have a Patreon, but we're currently um, transitioning from an old Patreon to a new one. So not really going to plug any of that there because we're still like figuring okay. stuff out on that end. You know what? Um, when it's ready, let me know. We'll just we'll update the show notes. We'll figure it right. out. But Sweet. people should be giving you money for this oh. very <laughs> fucking important and cool work that you're doing. Oh, yeah. thank you. Um, but that's that's basically where you could find us. I don't really have as much of an online presence personally as I used to. I want to, but like also doing stuff for the for the podcast is maybe be like maybe I just like I'm just a little bit quiet maybe I just don't mm-hmm. maybe I just don't need to do that Reasonable. right now yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so do you have uh, anything to plug uh, I mean yeah the basic podcast uh, social media uh, I have been more active with uh, joining actual plays somehow Uh Ooh. Even even just like in this month, um, I have at least one prepared, supposedly for later this year, um, and I'm joining one this weekend. So <laughs> look out on the social troll, uh, slovenly troll social media, I guess, for Lissa actual plays, maybe. 
since I seem to be like the one who gets super excited about new things and I'm like, oh, yes, let's make friends and play with other people. So, <laughs> oh, I mean, I all about it. Honestly, it's like a, a nice side side part of getting to talk to people. I'm like, yo, we should play together sometime because that would be yeah, super exactly. fun. And especially um, if it's like new systems, because like, I mean, mm-hmm. I play D, I play D&D twice a week. Um, I, I want to try like one shots and other things yeah. and meet new people yeah. and get to network with people and get to meet new people in the industry specific, specifically. It's, most people, most people have been utterly lovely. I mean, it, mo- everyone that I've spoken to directly, utterly lovely. And most people mm-hmm. in the communities that I've met seem wonderful. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Find Slovenly Trolls on all of the social medias and look for the Patreon later. Uh, we'll put links to the Janelle Jaquay's article and to the Uncaged Goddesses Sorts books. I'm not going to put links to Witchlight and Radiant Citadel because D&D Beyond gets enough tra- they fucking get traffic. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> they get enough. They don't need our and money. And we'll find, we'll find ones for She is the Ancient and the Islands of Sina Una. I, that looks really cool. Um, I know, Yeah. Right? Uh, Thank you guys again so much for joining me. This has been such a pleasure. Yeah, thank you, thank for, you for having, having us. us. Mm. And more to come. <laughs> <laughs>